chapter 2 and verse 1, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and that which was decreed against her. Remember that what's happened so far is a direct result of seven days of drinking the so-called royal wine in abundance, in excess in other words, pointing even toward the wine of fornication of the whore of Babylon written of in Revelation chapter 17. This book of Ishtar being a blueprint of how they go about infiltrating the kingdom, the Kenites that is to say, and remember in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel was even at this same geographic location, even though no mention of Esther, no mention of Mordecai, no mention of the decree that's written of in the book of Esther, but there is a he-goat written of there, which is symbolic of the Kenite nation, that goat nation. And that he-goat in Daniel chapter 8 breaks the horns, which are symbolic of power, of the ram. Historically, the ram and the two horns thereof symbolize the Medes and the Persians, but in the futurist sense, the two Christian nations of Ephraim and Manasseh, the British Commonwealth and the United States, infiltrated from within during the final generation by the he-goat, and you can better understand the hidden meaning of this book of Esther and why it was allowed, just as the Kenites have been allowed to take over the Christian nations from within via the four hidden dynasties of education, economics, politics, and religion. And here we see the blueprint of their very methodology, their MO, that is to say, and it's at 666 that most Christians will die spiritually and merge with Satan's religion completely, becoming the whore of Babylon, becoming a partaker of the evil deeds of that goat nation, the Kenites, which is why it says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, And I saw the woman, the whore of Babylon, which means confusion, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, with great wonder being better translated. He didn't admire seeing the whore of Babylon. It was a shocking thing for John to see, being one of the twelve apostles, to see most Christians merge themselves with Satan's religion at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. That's what he's seen in Revelation chapter 17. And again, as John wrote in the epistles, if you so much as wish them Godspeed, one who brings not the doctrine of Jesus Christ, that you become a partaker of their evil deeds, and that includes the blood guilt that is upon the sons of Cain, that goat nation. And remember that the Capri fig, the goat fig, that is to say, is the one with the inedible fruit. So there's your evil figs. It speaks of a nation that carry out the negative part of God's plan, the evil figs. And you also see in Revelation chapter 17, speaking of the great horror that sitteth upon many waters, and the waters are symbolic of the peoples of the world, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk, with the wine of her fornication. So it's no coincidence that this wine is written of in the book of Esther, which is a blueprint of the method of operation of the Kenites, who are the synagogue of Satan, through the deception, through the four hidden dynasties of education, economics, politics, and religion, they cause the spiritual drunkenness, the stupor, that is to say, whereby the world is deceived unless they get into our Father's word and remain sober and vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour through his children, the Kenites. Verse 2, Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti, and there's no historical record of any queen Vashti, any Queen Esther, or any of the events that we're reading of here. So again, it's the blueprint of the MO of the Kenites allowed by God to be included, whereby you can count those stones worn smooth over a long period of time to enumerate those stones, which are the Kenites, to understand who the Antichrist is, their father the devil, whereby you're not deceived because they will endorse him as the Messiah whenever he appears in Jerusalem at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. When Satan appears in Jerusalem as the false Christ, that's when the whore of Babylon says, I sit as a queen and am no widow, as you can read in Revelation chapter 18. And the thing pleased the king 
and he did so. Now, historically, there was a king Ahasuerus, which is a title like the pharaoh of Egypt. So as far as Ahasuerus goes, this is a false Ahasuerus and a false account of what transpired during his reign. You'll have an accurate account of what transpired in the books of Nehemiah as well as Daniel. And the book of Daniel is verified by Christ himself in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, as well as Revelation 13, which mirrors Daniel 7, but no mention of Esther. You would think Esther and Mordecai would at the very least be mentioned in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter as it's known, which basically summarizes all those throughout the word of God who through faith overcame, but it isn't. Nor is God's name mentioned in the book of Esther, only in acrostics, one red flag after the other. So here in the book of Esther, we have a false Ahasuerus, and as I said before, you could even see within this Ahasuerus a type of Antichrist, a ruler of a world empire, 127 provinces, who will see in this chapter take to wife Esther, which sounds suspiciously similar to the name Ishtar, the whore of Babylon, who says, I sit a queen and am no widow when the great apostasy occurs. So returning to the book of Eshtar and verse 5 of chapter 2, now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. Now you'll notice that this Mordecai, which means little man or worshiper of Mars, is usually taken to be a different individual than the one you see in Ezra and Nehemiah, and that very well could be. But if that were the case, one was a real person and one was fictitious, because the book of Esther has no historical confirmation, and more importantly, it's not mentioned anywhere else in the Word of God. Esther, Mordecai, the events, it has no witness in the Word of God. That's a red flag, but it's within the realm of possibility that the Mordecai we read of in the return to Jerusalem in Ezra and Nehemiah is the very Kenite author of this book of Esther, inasmuch as in Jeremiah 35, the Kenites, and we know they're the Kenites there in Jeremiah 35 because of 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, but it says there in Jeremiah 35 that God promised them that they should not want for a man to stand before him forever, and during that time, that man was Mordecai, which means little man or worshiper of Mars, and it's thought by some that this name Mordecai comes from the name Marduk, or Merodach, as you can read in Jeremiah chapter 50. An idol of the Babylonians, probably the planet Mars, the war planet, the red planet, which like Saturn, which is the sixth planet from the sun, was regarded by the ancient Shemites as the author of bloodshed and slaughter, and was propagated with human victims. So this Mordecai has a very strange name, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, which means a star, or hidden, like a fig leaf represents something that's hidden, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So now we have here Esther and Mordecai, and much has been made of the similarities between the Jewish so-called festival of Purim, which means law Lots, plural, to cast lots by using stones, and you know what those stones worn smooth over a long period of time are, the Kenites, which commemorates the rescue of the Jews, quote-unquote Jews, by Esther and Mordecai, and a Persian festival that celebrates the god Marduk and the female Ishtar, and their victory over their rivals, very similar to the subject matter of the book of Esther. It has been suggested that Esther and Mordecai are Hebrew forms of the names Ishtar and Marduk. So again, this has to do with Satan's mystery religion that we read of in Revelation 17, and most Christians will merge themselves with that religion, dying spiritually, no longer being Christians, because if you become a Satan worshiper, you're no longer a Christian. You're the whore of Babylon. You're no longer a virgin bride waiting for the true husband. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her the things for purification with such things as belong to her. And seven maidens, remember the whore of Babylon, rides upon a beast with seven heads, 
symbolic of Satan's one world religious system, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Now the Babylonian captivity was over with. There was no threat to the children of Judah or Benjamin, so why hide your people or your kindred? Again, this is the method of operation of the Kenites, and they like to hide, impersonating the children of Judah even unto this day. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Notice the M.O. here a double agent in Shushan, if this would have actually taken place. But the important thing to ascertain from this book of Esther is the strategy of the Kenites when infiltrating a kingdom. That's why God allowed this to be canonized. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. And you also find this word odors in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 13. We keep seeing Revelation 13, 18. What about 18, 13 of Revelation? It says, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine. There's the wine again, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. That's the merchandise of Babylon. And we're reading here of Ishtar, who is symbolic of the whore of Babylon. I think that's pretty obvious at this point. Notice six mentioned twice here. And I remind you of Revelation 13, 18, where it says to count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, that man of sin, the son of perdition, and his number is 666. To count means to use pebbles in enumeration, those stones worn smooth over a long period of time. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubine. She came in unto the king no more except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name Ishtar. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, worshipper of Mars, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month to Beth, in the seventh year of his reign. There's that number seven again. Remember that seven-headed beast with ten horns, and those ten horns are symbolic of ten fallen angel kings who shall hate the whore and eat her flesh and make her naked and burn her with fire. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So this false Ahasuerus, symbolic of the Antichrist, if you will, favored this Esther more than all the virgins, more than those that remain true to the true Christ, if you wanted to look at this on that level, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Notice the instead of there. Again, Antichrist. Satan is the Antichrist, which means instead of Christ. And there will be a false wedding at that time because he is the fake lamb. He has two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon because he is the dragon. And as Christ said in Mark chapter 13, Woe unto those that are with child and give suck when I return. Woe unto those that are no longer virgins, spiritually speaking, and that have been impregnated in their mind with Satan's deception, the mark of the beast. And he appears at 666. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, looking forward to that false wedding feast at the sixth trumpet. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him.
So we see Mordecai behind the scenes, the man behind the curtain, and that's how the globalist Kenites formulate the one world political system now, through the four hidden dynasties behind the scenes, and we've seen already within this fictitious story, but yet it is the blueprint of their method of operations, Mordecai has manipulated this situation in the favor of that goat nation, the Kenites. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, Two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. The first time you see this word wroth in the King James Bible concerns Cain, and the Kenites are the sons of Cain. So there's that to take into consideration. But why are these two wroth and seeking to murder King Ahasuerus? Was this situation manipulated by Mordecai as well within the framework of this work of fiction? Because as we'll find out later, this incident here is what leads up to the complete infiltration, which results in a genocide, which is written nowhere in history. But the Kenites like to say, we have every right to defend ourselves. So they'll commit false flag attacks giving them the excuse to go and butcher people, committing genocide. It's been going on nonstop ever since the Kenites came into power through the shadow government. Look at what happened in Russia with the murder of the Tsar and all the people that were butchered there. And later on, because of communism, that was the Kenites that did that, an alliance between Esau and the sons of Cain. That's who was behind the communist revolution and the resulting genocide that transpired afterwards, both in Russia and China, and so on and so forth. And then you have the return in 1948 and the genocide that continues to this day there, day after day, slowly but surely. So understand that these are the sons of Cain, who was of his father, the devil, a murderer from the beginning. That's why Cain slew Abel, because he was the son of Satan. So we have these two conspiring to murder the king, and of course Mordecai finds out about it somehow. Did he put this into their minds? Evil spirits even at work here, perhaps, to turn the situation in the favor of the Kenites. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Remember the Spanish Inquisition? Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. But was it really written in the book of the Chronicles before the king? As I said, you can't document this book as history, but it is obviously a blueprint allowed by God to be brought forth, whereby we understand the M.O. of the Kenites.